Greetings, fellow scholars of the livestream! I'm Mizuma Zad from the Cosmo Canyon Observatory, and today we will cover parts of the Yuffie DLC trailer dropped at the last state of play. Wait, who's this weird Mizuma Zad guy? I don't recognize his voice. Wait, I do recognize this voice. Has been a while, hasn't it? Have you missed me? Since there's so much work piling up, I decided to do a rough analysis of the Yuffie DLC trailer, which will allow me to bring him out faster, since there's no script, just notes, and free talking while recording and record the visuals at the same time as I'm talking. Which means barely any editing. Well, maybe a little. An addendum video in the same format to Game Analysis 24 was already done, ready to render and upload, on the day the State of Play trailer dropped, or the State of Play happened. And I couldn't just upload that one while everyone was in Integrate and Yuffie hype mode, so I had to push back this one as well, which increased the gap even more, so I apologize for a long drought of content. But this should change from today on, because there's so much that's been in the works, so content should release much faster from now on, at least for a little while. Kudakuma will still record future scripted videos and episodes, but for now, the next few videos will be rough analysis with my own voice. And since I'm not really good at free talking, please bear with me while I stumble my way through this video. <laughs> today we'll cover only the environments and the characters, as story predictions and the battle system will follow later. And without further ado, let's jump into it. And right at the beginning it starts to become interesting, for those who pay close attention. Do you see all those weird symbols around the looking glass focus area? Or scope, if you will? I couldn't find anything that looks alike as in exactly those symbols, so they seem to be a completely new invention. However, in Final Fantasy XIV, we find a similar script, which looks similar, but has completely different glyphs, and is also used for the ninja class, for the ninjutsu techniques, which ties into Yuffie very beautifully. And to um, go further in this uh, analogy, here, when Yuffie doesn't have her uh, shuriken in hand, she'll use those probably ninjutsu techniques with glyphs all around her and in front of her. And she can also use abilities that kind of look like summon glyph thingies, whatever you want to call them. Of his huge symbols with all of the same script you see all around here. For example, this one in the middle can be found here, just flipped over. This small one here and here can be found also here, flipped over. And I think down here. No, this is a different one. And there's also one over here at the top right, which can be found here, I believe. Yep. So it, they're not just random symbols, so it seems like that Wutai uses different script, different language. So it's not only based on Japan visually, it also has its own script, like Japan with hiragana, katakana and kanji, but just translated into some fantasy setting with fantasy glyphs. It's pretty cool, isn't it? And here we can also already see we're within a sector here. Most likely Sector 7, of course, which we'll see later. There's Sectors 6 and 5. And there we can also spot a small wall over here. And beyond the wall is just the background, as in the skybox. So we don't see the town in Sector 7, unfortunately, just random buildings. But at least we can see the pillar the support pillar of the plate, where we need to ascend to Battle Reno and Root, and some other stuff here, we'll, which we'll get to later. 
So it seems this actually rendered out part here, besides the support pillar, is completely new. And everything we know is beyond, but not rendered yet, because it's too far away. And then the pigeons come, throw Yuffie off, literally, <laughs> throw her off the roof. And within those few seconds, we already see a lot of things in the background. So first off, we have here the sector separation uh, wall, which you can also see here for other sectors. And slightly over here for another one, so this... So if to the right is sector 7 and to the, right, to the left is sector 8, this wall must connect to reactor number 8, so this must be 1, 2, and over here reactor number 3. Which means sectors 2, 1, and 8. And right here, while Yuffie falls, we see a few more details. For example, this probably unused trade track, rail track, for moving around wares, I believe. Because this seems to be some sort of warehouse. But not only that, we also see this little poster, which seems to be a Moogle. The nose, the ears, the wings. Pretty cool, eh? What is also interesting, might just be my imagination, but those symbols or plates here, or whatever those are, we can see six strokes on this one, and maybe a vague ten on this one. And when does this DLC and integrate release? June 10th. Not sure how we could translate this one into 2021 or something, but let's just keep going. What's also pretty interesting is, doesn't really look like anything here, but in one of the official screenshots, which is not taken from the trailer, we see Yuffie here, showing off the materia, some sort of wall in the background, which could be a building, some other kind of wall in the shadows, and more either stones here or sandbags here, and some red bucket of sorts. And if we try to, to imagine how this looks back there, it really looks like sandbags and rock side building wall in the shadows and building wall in the light here. And this could fit this building. So it seems like she's standing somewhere in front of here in, within a scene just before we start actual gameplay. So she falls, dusts herself off, exits the building, does some poses, Yuffie, Materia Hunter! I'm gonna find the ultimate Materia! Or whatever her dialogue or monologue will be here, and then gameplay starts. And for the sake of the analysis, I decided to rearrange the trailer into chronological order, which also means the next scene won't be Avalanche's hideout, but some, something different. But before that, here we see how uh, where she falls towards this building here, right next to the wall. But here's also something that mm, ruffle my jimmies. Do you see this weird star above here? In the still image, one could imagine this is kind of uh, an effect or so of sorts, but it's not. It just stays. So it looks like this is the top, or the apex, or the north pole, if you will, of the spherical skybox. And for some reason they messed up the UV mapping up here, so that the pipes here, or the environment, is warped. Doesn't look good at all. And this is the next scene we're going to cover, because this happens right after. If you don't believe me, check this out. In this scene, right before where she falls, you can see a building back here, and also a pipe. Please keep this pipe in mind. And all of those elements, just keep those in mind for later. Some silos, some red vertical scaffolding walls. 
and this building here on this side relative to this pipe and there seems to be a path over there now see this building it's still in front of the pillar far away like before and now remember this uh, wagon carriage train wagon carriage for later plus the rails here as well next scene we also see the same train carriage wagon carriage and more rails or some sort of cargo cars stands on and here we already see the red vertical struts the silo in the back and the walls here we see them a little bit better and in the next scene where Yuffie throws her shuriken against some boxes we see this huge pipe and the same struts walls and the silo in the background and for that I have some better visualizations here for comparison here's where she falls pipe silo vertical red struts walls same here and in the battle which happens around here we also see this complex which is also seen back here so everything fits neatly together and since the pipe is there right next to here which we see here again where she throws it this also means that the building we see in the background where Yuffie falls is the one she fights a lesser drake just on the side and something else up here we just can barely see those walls we can also see in the shot where she's still standing on the sector wall sector separation wall so now we have a pretty good picture of the start the gameplay section of the start of the dlc pretty neat isn't it and one last thing before we continue to the next scene is this construction back there which seems to be kind of a bridge of sorts maybe a rail highway or however you want to call it do we cross this with a mining wagon of sorts or maybe even a hand pump train car would be kind of neat kind of a parallel to the short mini game with Sid where we have to stop the train from crashing into North Corral which is also on a similar train highway train railway next to some rocks and on a similar construction Looking forward to it. Alright, now we reached the hideout of Avalanche, of the main branch, mind you, not Barrett's Avalanche cell. And there's there are also a few cool things to find in here. So, let's start. First up, do you see this? A neat little Moogle plushie, which of course fits. The cloak Yuffie's wearing is also a Moogle cloak, but more on that later and some other little detail which we'll see right here see this in the background purple circular chest circular from above mind you which means a new weapon for either sonos uh, sonon or yuffie probably yuffie for her second ability to learn now what's also very interesting is the trick she does with the materia it's green now then it's purple then it's yellow. That in itself is just cool, but there is more. Do you see this? The material she has equipped in her shuriken. Green, purple and yellow. Green, purple, yellow. Neat little detail, isn't it? Now I just noticed I forgot to show you something. A small little theory. Before Yuffie goes or meets Avalanche, she has to enter Sector 7 proper, as in a town. What's out outside of town? Scrapyard. Scrapyard Boulevard. So it could be that she enters through here. Because we never got to go beyond this gate here, but there's clearly a, a way, a pathway. Or she enters through this other mini valley of sorts where we fought and defeated the Wrath Dog. Or she comes through some other area like the te Teleka Factory or where we rescued Johnny which is yet another side path but we'll see and now 
I present you a really interesting find. Yeah, here. You see this planning whiteboard in the background here? Now, let's have a close look, shall we? Do you see this? The lobby, where the library is located, and a floor above the cafeteria. You don't believe me? Look at how it's built. Some stuff on the side here, a bigger square, a connection corridor, and a bigger one with a huge circle within. Could only be this. This one, a circle with a side path, circle with a side path, some more stuff above with some details which have weight on the right with some circle looking areas here. And this whole huge lobby area with the exhibition part. We have two pillars, two pillars, here another pillar, and a, a big one over there. Some stuff in, in between, the wall of light in between. We also have the reception desk in here. And the shape also uh, fits quite well with the stairs here and here. The only thing that throws me off a little bit is this side area, which wasn't part of the building. Maybe it's, it just looks like it because they put some other weird magnets or what have you on the side. And also, speaking of side, where we enter the area, the lobby, we take the elevators, run through kind of a waiting area, which, is, which can also be seen here pretty well. I'm pretty sure there's a little bit more in between here. Maybe even uh, the garage, but it didn't really fit this part here. But this is more than enough. Maybe this is the outside, some parts of the outside, which we didn't get to see. But I think this should suffice. That this, this is definitely a plan to infiltrate Shinra HQ in some fashion. If you remember in Chapter 16, they did kind of attack Shinra HQ. We heard an explosion while talking to Wedge. And Wedge also said that they're there to extract friendlies. And they had already had an extraction plan. And the Nevalanche Chopper was also waiting for us to reach the top to get us out of there. But then Rufus came and the rest is history. What's also interesting, the library is where the mayor is located. And we know he's also part of Avalanche. And on the floor above in the cafeteria, another avalanche sympathizer is waiting for us to upgrade the keycard or give a new keycard. And this is of course where we enter the Shinra building. So it's pretty interesting and I'm really looking forward to have a look at this in the DLC itself in very, very intricate detail. All right, let's continue. There's also of course an avalanche poster in the back. Not really surprising. But what's also interesting is here, when Sono, Sonon arrives, I always want to say Sonos, <laughs> that's something completely different. Here, the second one we saw before, the second one with the yellow hair, cannot be seen in the scene when Sono, Sonon arrives. He's already gone. We'll get to that later. All right, that's about it for, for this one. Unless you want me to tell you that this is in a basement. You can see stairs back there and where Sonon, of course, comes down from. And it's also seen in the background here, Dufy. So it's, de it's definitely below ground. Because we don't see any window or door anywhere in, the, in here. So next up is, or are, some scenes in the Undercity. We finally arrive in a place we're familiar with, which also suggests that this avalanche hideout which is not the one in 7th Heaven, of course, because, as we'll see later, Barrett's Avalanche Cell and the main Avalanche branch, which they talk about in descriptions of this trailer, are separate, and they don't want to meet each other. So this, it's different, but since we're running as Yuffie through Sector 7, this other hideout also has to be in Sector 7. And I have a feeling it could be in or near Beginner's Hall, where the weapon shop is also located, because just right next to it, there's the Neighborhood Watch's office, where Weimer and Chadley are standing in front of, which is only 
one story high, which has some sort of generator on top. But it's possible that they are there, and Yuffie then comes from there, runs towards Seventh Heaven, where we then meet from afar Barrett and Tifa and Biggs. Here you can see Seventh Heaven, Johnny's house or home, and back there there is a a shop with some tires of sorts or cogs, cogwheels. The second entrance. Because here in the next one, next scene, we see everyone, or half of everyone, waiting until Barrett and the others go inside, so they can walk through without being seen. You can see this is the alleyway, or avenue, which is full of little shops. You see back there with Yuffie. Here, those on the side. And something that I still have a gripe with is texture quality of some flat 2D textures with text on it and it's still still the same bad quality as in the vanilla game, base game, and still has rough patches on the ground, so maybe they'll it's still not fixed. Maybe it won't get fixed, who knows? I really hope all the textures get sharper versions. Anyway, tangent over. And as we see over there, here this building has some kind of mini awning with some construction parts which is the same we see here when they where they hide behind it's it's this part so this is why Yuffie running through sector 7 happens right before this scene what's also pretty interesting or funny is that here next to seventh heaven there's still the same guy trying to lift the barrel since they just came back from the second bombing mission, because they lost Cloud and has have to explain this to Biggs. This is in Chapter 8, parallel to Cloud meeting Aerith. And this guy is still trying to lift the same barrel, it's just ludicrous. <laughs> and some other points of reference we see in here. This is the same construction with the sign. You can also barely see the tires and the cogs in the shop back there. and. The arrow that shows, shows us the way to 7th Heaven with the bar sign, this, this can also be seen when we're just running around Sector 7 here. But that's about it here. And the next scene is further down the road, as in this road, and just at the base of the pillar, where this guy, this avalanche guy here, is trying to divert or distract the guards so that Sonon and Yuffie can go through without being spotted. Where is this? Well, as I said before, it's the plaza just below the support pillar. Here you can see the blackboard, where the guy keeps ripping down avalanche flyers in Chapter 3 at the beginning, where Cloud has this, uh, this premonition, which we will talk about in a future video about Cloud and Sephiroth, which is still being worked on. The script is almost finished. But yeah, stuff happened. Anyway, he tries to divert or distract the guards here. In the back we can see the complex just below pillar. Here you see the gate with the number 7. And you can also see here another guy trying to rip out a pole, which is also seen in uh, where we just run around the place in the game itself as a point of reference. And then Yuffie and so on give chase, which is kind of weird. This is where I'm still not quite sure where they're actually going. Because in the Japanese version, they, uh, Sonon say, says, and the German version, let's follow them. Them as in, I don't know, the guards and the other guy, which doesn't make really any sense. Because this other guy is meant to draw the guards away from the point you and Sonon need to go through. Otherwise, why just chase him? Which probably means chase or go after someone else. On the other hand, in the English version, he, he says, we gotta help. Help who? Help the guy who lured them away so that Yuffie and Sonon, Sonon can actually do something without being spotted. It doesn't really make any sense in this context. However, we see here, this is where we come from. Here above is the number 7. And back there is the entrance to the Gallagher... Uh, Gallagher. <laughs> MJ Gallagher. To the Telegraph factory where Norjin is guarding the place or the door. Oh, here's Weimer! I didn't see him before, which is interesting. Hang on, this makes much more sense now. So, 
Weimer is in the plot, this changes things. So this means that Weimer, maybe others are helping them to get to where they need to be. Weimer helps, who else helps? Maybe Norgin does, is Norgin also part of Avalanche? Probably. Anyway, let's keep going. Here's Here are the two blue trucks, which we also need to run around to get to the Telegraph Factory entrance here. And as you can see, Sonon runs towards the trucks. It seems like he wants to run around. Looks towards where the yellow-haired guy lured the guards towards. So you, really, you usually don't do that because you look to the side if you want to look at something that's not in your path. Otherwise, you look forward. So it really look, looks like they want to run around. I run around or go through this gate. Both is possible. To the left, it would be the Telga factory, which would need to incorporate a new exit for us to go through. Or we actually enter this part here, run around the pillar and to the back and then to the new complex we'll see later. We'll see how this will play out. Although there is another theory. What if they really followed the guards and the yellow-haired guy to the train station where they're headed to? Let me show you a few comparisons for further context. Now you might already know where this is going. First of all, check this screenshot from the battle where both use team attacks against Cripshase and probably the Edgehead here. Have a look at those tethered walls in the background. They look pretty much the same like in this shot with Eligor, right? Although the background is completely different, instead of rocks, there are buildings. However, as far as I can see and as far as I could find out, the train graveyard is the only place which actually contains those assets, which are in fact exactly the same, just rearranged differently. And if we have a look what's beyond, we see also a lot of rocks, kind of similar to those we've seen at the beginning of the trailer, Diofi. So it's the outskirts. We also see a lot of rocks here. So it's not far-fetched to say that this building here is somewhere within the train graveyard, or close to it at least. And since we know where their goal is, a facility very close to the central spire, we also need to make sure that wherever they move towards, the actual goal is the central spire, which is here pretty close. And here we are still in the battle against Eligor in the screenshot. And back there we do see the central spire. Like if we backtrack through the whole train graveyard, we see the spire. It's a little bit off if we compare it to the next screenshot. Sector 7 train station and in the back we see the same central spire. However, the train graveyard is here somewhat to the left. Or let's just say for the sake of simplicity, northwest. But we need to go forward, kind of north, almost. So it stands to reason that Sonon and Yuffie need to reach the train station, go through the grades here on the side, and then walk along the train rails, probably move away from the previous path to actually get around all the rocks, which we've seen before, like those here, which are around here. So it's quite a good guess that we need to run through this part around known paths and known areas, and then to that new ground to finally reach the central spire. On the other hand, it's still possible that we need to go through the telegraph factory or around the support pillar and then adjust our trajectory to reach the central spire from the other side here, other side of the train station. Everything is possible. So we'll just have to wait and see until we know more. Oh, just one thing before we continue. Two purple materia in Sonon's weapon. We'll see that later as well. I think we can see it a little bit closer here. Yep. Two materia. And now we're in new territory again with Yuffie. So this is not the part we've seen in the beginning. Yuffie was alone, as we can see here. She's completely alone. And here she's with Sonon, so it's later. Now, where is this place? It's Pretty hard to say. Seems to be just some other complex and it's pretty dark. So at first I thought it's in the, during the night. 
for some reason. Even back there, it kind of looks like night. Even there is some light, which looks dark. However, do you see this part of the rock, which is illuminated? Here we have the screens in comparison. Here's the part that looks dark. But here's the official screenshot, which is a little to the right from here. Because you see this element is the exact same as this element. And here we can see the rock poking through like here. So this is this one. But here everything is completely cast in light. And this part is pretty, pretty much light up. And here we can see one of the rocks. It's not seen here because it needs to be up there. It's not the exact same rock here, but it's also illuminated. So it seems like this part here is cast in darkness because it's covered by some other construction or roofs or what have you, which is pretty interesting. But let's continue. This is battle stuff, but we can already see them teaming up with a uh, team up attack. <laughs> So this was just to show off team up attacks. We'll come to this scene later, but for now, this is just everything I want to cover here. Next one is Yuffie's Limit Break. The Limit Break itself we'll cover in a different video pertaining to battles, but we can already look at the surroundings. What's interesting here is that we have here three pipes, which we see later again, which are pretty much a copy of those in Mako storage in the reactors. This part here you can see poking out from the Mako pool. It's just some neat reference, nothing of importance. But what is important here to maybe see where this is located, we see some rocky ground down there and kind of an, an exit or an open wall. So this is still ground level, which means this is level one or two. And here we are on level 3 or 4, depending on uh, how many more layers or floors there are beneath that. I tried to find connections between this part and this one, but I didn't really find any conclusive evidence, so I'll just leave it be. First I thought this part here, there are two pillars of sorts with a corridor. And here we see a similar scenario, here a pillar, here probably something with corridor, but the construction and the visuals don't, didn't add up, so I just left it. It could be because there's a huge part here cast in shadow below. Might still be the case, we just don't see this part, but the other part. It does make sense that the part before where Yuffie's fighting with Sonon is below this part, because otherwise we'll go through buildings upon buildings upon buildings, which will just drag out everything, and I don't think that's the case. And here we see those pipes again, with the same kind of frames above, for which I've also prepared a comparison screen. Which is here. Here we can see the same triplets of pipes growing out of the wall. Like here, which we've seen before the same area, and it looks exactly the same as those within the Marco pool in Marco storage in Marco reactor 1 and 5 as well, just in blue. Now what's also interesting, if we go back a little bit, we can also see a letter back there. So it's possible that we have to climb up all the way from the bottom to up here, and then maybe run over this narrow catwalk to over here, maybe, or the other way around. It's hard to see because there's not much. I also don't think there's any way to see if those two over here are connected, but that's not really important. What is important is this possibly crash strike net garbage. If we zoom in a little, it's just one. Maybe it's just for decoration, but where I see those nets, I expect crash strikes. Down here in the slums, you, you ask? Everything's possible in Midgar. And over here, we also see a platform up high. It's possible that it's just the ceiling, but I do see some room up there. Maybe it's possible we also need to go up there, maybe not. We'll see, I guess. Because it 
also leads to over there. It's possible that this is accessible through here, through this wall, maybe through a door. Maybe we need to we need to access this platform first, move around this this garbage pile, enter the other side and up, and then reach this one to go wherever, or maybe it's just an optional area, or maybe it's nothing. Who knows? As for location, I can see this to be behind the telegraph factory and the plate pillar, somewhere behind, like this new area we've seen in the beginning, in the background, but it's hard to say. But what's really bothering me is the end of this here. You see that? When she comes down, check her leg. Quite a weird bend here and also clipping like hell. It looks kind of weird, but this is just a nitpick. You probably won't see it anyway. And more clipping. <laughs> I hope they fix that. Now, the next one is also very interesting. It doesn't look like much. So first off, we have wall running blah, 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 with Sonon. So he's already here, which means this is probably in the same facility. Also, the walls look similar. If you compare this to this, it's also slightly angled and has similar slabs, and similar patterns. So either it's within the same thing vertically or just ad adjacent. Maybe there are multiple rooms, but this is all speculation. What is not speculation is that after wall running and over, when you get over to there, this side here, you can smash some crates, walk up the stairs and reach this platform. So it's 2-1 and 2-2. Two, 2 two might designate the area or even the floor. Not quite sure, but 1 and 2 could also mean that we need... that this is the first area we need to go to and 2-2 two, two is the second. And then we need to look out for 2-3, possibly. Or maybe this is just one sub-level higher, like level 2, sub-level level 1, level 2, sub-level 2. Now comes the interesting part. Do you see those those stripes, those glowing um, vertical elements here, and the arrows up and down. Now let's go back here at the beginning. Do you see this small segment of the whole circle with the, with the arrow? Doesn't this remind you of the circle we see for Barrett when he can shoot things, or in chapter 15, where we need to find spots to pull us up with the grappling gun? Looks quite similar. So it seems to me like Yuffie's close to an interaction point with Square. And in this Gematsu article, it also says or reveals that Yuffie can throw a shuriken at switches to interact with them. So I theorize that she had to throw a shuriken to a switch to activate this whole piece of grate here to move it from below up or from up to this level in order to wall run across. Unfortunately, we don't really see what's below, which is kind of a shame. I do see more great stuff. So this is pr practically or possibly just level one. One little side note about wall running. It's actually physically accurate wall running. You see, Yuffie holds onto this railing here and runs on the below railing. So it actually makes sense. Same with Sonon. We don't see it here, but there's a screenshot where we see it better. All right, the next one is also quite interesting. I placed this one here in the same area for one because of the background, which looks quite the same as before. But also because of those ropes or poles or whatever. Because at first I thought, well, she just slides down and it is a one-way trip, which would place this after the boss battle for a quick backtracking without going through the whole maze again to get back down. But no, you can see this red circling, this red circles around this pole. They move with Yuffie. And the one on the other side goes the other direction. You see it here perfectly. If I go forward, this one goes down. Yuffie also goes down, this one on the left goes up. Which means she can slide down 
and then pull herself up on the other side. And I theorize that she either has to activate something down there, or it is an optional side path with materia, good items, some bangle of sorts, whatever you can imagine. Which is why I placed it here, and it seems to be quite high up. We go one, two, three levels down at least. Because it's not done yet, she still slides farther down. And what I also can see is that this walkway or doorway might lead to, the, to this place, as I've mentioned before. So either over here to this platform above or the one below. And for both, we, we don't see where they lead to because of camera angles. So it's possible this is adjacent to this area on the other side. Possibly. Now the next short scene is right before the boss battle. Why, you ask? Well, let me show you a few things. Besides her Naruto running over this place, there's not much to see. Unless you want to see Son Sonon's materia again, which should enter the screen right here. Yes. Otherwise, it's just this angle you don't see much more. But you can memorize this pattern of struts or scaffolding. This pipe here, stairs down and possibly ramp down. Why ramp? Let me show you. Now, this is the place where we fight the boss, where it's falling from above. And after we beat it, we see a similar angle and a cutscene with this yellow haired guy which is, by the way, very close to the central spire. Now, do you see those struts again? The scaffolding? It's pretty much the same, isn't it? Not convinced? Let me show you this first. Uh, this is just some something I found. This is also close to the central spire. It's after Platefall. We see similar struts also. Could be remnants of this. Maybe, maybe not. But it's still pretty cool to see consistency here, or at least perceived consistency. Now, back to this boss area. I told you that there's a ramp. You see it here and here. And this construction in front is similar to the one we see here. You also see the pipe running horizontally. This one. And we can also see stairs, but not in this one, but here. It's a bit closer. You can see stairs, flight of stairs, and to the side as well. So we run over the, the walkway, down the stair, down the stair, possibly down the stair on the side, and then down the ramp, and then boss fight starts. Same as here. And you can see the pipe, the horizontal pipe again, plus this horizontal strut or scaffolding piece. So it is the same. And before we keep going, just some HP comparison. This one on the left is the shot with Yuffie battling a lesser Drake. We have 2566 HP max. Here's the team battle attack with Sonon in this shadowy area. She has a bit more HP, 2694. And during the boss battle she has max HP of 2782. So it adds all up. It's good progression. Now let's go to the boss battle. What is still quite curious is where does it drop from? Because above we couldn't see anything in the screen before. Like here, there's nothing dangling or hanging. It's possible that it can crawl up on the side and then just jumps in here and it looks like it's falling right from above. It is possible. I hope this is the case. It's also pretty interesting is that it has seven legs on either side. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Fits perfectly in this game. Now, there's not much else to say about the area without going into the boss fight, which will happen in a different video. So let's just maybe watch it for a few seconds, just to enjoy some battle action. So you can see the surroundings again. And then at the end, when they finally finish off the boss, well, this is only phase one, because you see it, 
pulls out the drill. More on that in another video. And here, after their fist bump, or during their fist bump, we see Sector 6 plate, the unfinished or the broken Sector 6 plate on the left, which means we are under Sector 7. Just as an aside and proof that we're still in Sector 7 in the slums. And up next is the train ride. There's not too much to say other than NPCs. Especially the creepy one here in the middle. And one that kind of looks like Noel from Final Fantasy XIII 2, but that's not really important. Many of those NPCs can also be found in Sector 7, as in the city, the town. And I'll show you a few of those. First, we have this, this backpacker with this uh, funny haircut. Then we have this guy who perpetually tries to lift the barrel and doesn't succeed, which is here. And a creepy dude can also be found in Sector 7. A bleach blonde girl in the green jacket, also here. Then a tan woman who lost her pastry to the cat, which we have to retrieve, which can be found over here. Then some other N random NPC with a cap on, which can be found here. And this chap, which is standing over there in the corner. Another tanned girl with this funny lock on the side and the kinda green shirt, can be found here. And this woman in the front, it's a little bit blurry because she was pretty far on the side, but this is the best I could find pretty quickly. It's here. Same place, we can see this chap. Probably the same, not, not quite the same angle, but looks the same. Also black jacket. And then the girl with the free shoulder and the green top can be seen here. Short haircut. And the guy on the left is the one back there, because the hoodie and the shirt look the same as well. Then there's uh, this guy here, the bearded guy, which we can barely see because of the perspective, but it's still the same one. Still ha also has the um, wristbands. There's also this woman who has the same hairstyle here and here. Color's a bit different, but that's because of the lighting. And this woman at the bottom has similar hairstyle to this one. Now what's also interesting is that they go through an ID scan. The second ID scan, which Jesse made, like the IDs made by Jesse, failed the scan in the second bombing mission. And this is after the second bombing mission. So the main branch of Avalanche has much more resources to fake the IDs, which still work, which is interesting. Now, at first, people might think, oh, Sonon is kind of a creeping around Yuffie here, but that's, that couldn't be farther from the truth, because he only does that to shield her from all the other passengers. And maybe other passengers might grope her or get too close or wh whatever. But she does kind of look a bit uncomfortable, maybe because it's crammed in here, who knows. So the next area is deep ground. Why deep ground? Well, you'll see shortly. First, deep ground soldiers here, which I'll show you shortly. This thing here also looks very interesting, this part. First I thought, well, it just looks kind of similar to the VR domes in Dreamray HQ, which it kind of does, but if we compare it with something found in Dirt of Cerberus, we find this sphere here, which, is also, which has also similar spikes, kind of, and also has a Marco pool down below, which isn't here on the screen, and there also seems to be some something glowing down there. And guess where this leads to? Vincent has to go through a few hallways, down a few steps, then through a unique hallway, which ends in a chamber where Vice is held. And Vice is also featured at the end of this trailer. Gets your noggin joggin. The surroundings aren't quite the same, but they didn't shy away from redesigning everything anyway, especially in Shinra HQ, so it's still possible that this is actually the same area here. And now let's go to 
Spice. We see him in this sepia tone on the throne and forming in VR. This kind of also has the same VR background. And here we see it again. Also VR background, where we fight in. And yes, in interviews, Nomura said he's just a fighter or an opponent in VR, because he wanted to see how a fight between Cloud and Weiss will turn out. It's pretty much an additional VR battle. However, why do they also show him on his throne within his prison in deep ground and in a different tone, not in blue, but in sepia. Current theory is that he's actually sitting down there, conscious, using the synaptic net dive, which he is able to do in Dirty Cerberus, to hack into the VR computer and project himself, hence him forming inside, not just appearing, but actually forming. He's not formed fully. He does form himself. And he does also say that Vice is not the final boss in Yuffie DLC. But he didn't deny that he's not, or that he is in there. So it's possible that he's actually canonically within the Yuffie DLC, even in the story, but isn't being fought. He's still in there, chained, contained, whatever, but is still able to do stuff. And it's also interesting that he says, let the hunt begin. This doesn't really make sense for just a VR battle. So it has to have ties to the story. But more on that in another video where we predict story and the ending of the UFO DLC and more. Now let's go through all the characters and enemies real quick, just the optics. Sonon kind of reminded me a little bit of the Utai soldiers, or however you want to call them but only because of the shoulder pads, the layered shoulder pads, that's about it. The rest doesn't really look alike, which is probably due to him just wearing casual outfit, not warrior outfit, but he does have a bow staff, which they do as well, although those have axes attached, axe blades, and can also shoot some projectiles out of them. So it's kind of an axe blade of sorts which this is not, which could speak to Sonon's more pacifistic approach. Maybe he doesn't really like to kill people, just knock them out. Next up is Yuffie's Moogle Cloak, which is directly taken out of Dirt of Cerberus. Although she now has a Moogle Pom Pom and a nose, red one, and different ears, like the exact ears the Moogle in Final Fantasy VII Remake has. But still, those button eyes, pretty cute, and the stitching. Here, just not red. Still retained belt around here. The rest looks pretty good, pretty good. And this is one of many indications that there's a Cerberus lore will become actual canon also within the remake and have much more weight in the story. Here's Yuffie without the cloak. Very, very faithful to the original design. Besides the multi-layered shoulder guard here and two buttons or rivets instead of just one. It's practically the same. You can also include the yellow color of this um, piece of cloth versus the green one. But the rest, the hot pants unbuttoned, still the same. Straps, the fishnet, the socks and the shoes and her arm guard with this weird circular thingy. What's different is she has this yin-yang-like symbol on her shoulder guard and here it's a crescent moon with a, I don't know, sparrow or something, which could be an allusion to the crescent moon unit or however they're called in uh, Crisis Core. These guys, they also have a crescent moon here. Now in terms of her face, it's also very well done, especially her shinobi headband. Still, the angled plate is there. It's pretty cool. Next up, we have Avalanche. We'll go more into those in, in another video. But in Chapter 4, we see six armed Avalanche members. Those are only four, and those don't really look like fighters. So 
Definitely not those. I'm pretty sure. We have never seen either of those. And I also came up with, uh, with this that they might represent Nelly, Al and Finn and someone else. Which Barrett talks about in his resolution scene. Which we can also quickly check out. About people like Finn, lazy little punk. Kid would do damn near anything except what you told him. But ask him to paint you a picture, and boy, howdy. No stamps in the tunnels. Finn's work, every one. Then there's Al, intel guy. He had these tricks for stealing codes I still don't understand. Stole his share of hearts, too. But when it came to the ladies, he just had the one trick. Bouquet of flowers hidden behind his back. Funny to think, some of them might have even come from here. He pulled a flower trick on Tifa once, believe it or not. <laughs> she told him where to stick them. Of course she did. Our quartermaster Nelly had a good laugh at that. She was tight with Jesse. People sometimes took him for sisters, even. They'd say no way and get upset, but then they'd start giggling and, you know. Now, since they're confirmed to be part of Avalanche's main branch, probably the main branch in Midgar, not the overall main branch, because they don't really look like leaders of all Avalanche, and since they're not the same as those, they are also called the Old Guard from Avalanche HQ. And this is just the main branch. So main branch Midgar, Barrett is just a side cell that have been cast off from the main ones. Now, you can say that this girl here doesn't really look like Jessie and they wouldn't mistake her for Jessie's sister. Maybe it's just mannerisms. Or how they talk to each other, how close they are. We don't know because we haven't seen it. They both seem to have brown eyes and also dark hair. Sisters not necessarily have to have the exact same hair color, but should, theoretically. And I've heard people say, well, she does look more like Tifa, though. If you go by only the hair, yeah, maybe. Maybe even the cheeks, cheekbones and stuff. And how she presents herself in the trailer. But we've seen so little of it that it's hard to say. This is just as an aside. Nelly and Finn are also on the leaderboards at darts. Al not, probably because either he doesn't play or he's just that bad. So they are definitely in Sector 7 also. So this kind of confirms that they're in, a, in the basement within Sector 7. If this one's Nelly, then those two are either Finn or Al. Not sure which one is which. I could go with Finn for this one, as he's an artist and has his hair dyed. On the other hand, this one has a bandana and long hair, could also fit for an artist. And he also kind of looks like a ladies' man, which Al is. So it could be this one's the ladies' man and this one's the artist. This one's just a new one. I don't think this is either Finn or Al. If they're even those guys, it could be completely new guys and the other ones are just world building. And we never see those. The only thing that she doesn't really look like Jessie and doesn't behave like Jessie in this trailer is the only counter argument against them being Nelly, Al and Finn. Let's just quickly look at her outfit because this one is pretty interesting. It's kind of a shirt, but also not really. And uh, it's like two pieces of hanging cloth shaped as, as a cross to hold up her skirt. I don't know, it's kind of weird, but not too bad either. Here we can also see that she has pockets on her skirt, which is pretty handy. So before, we already theorized that those people here represent the other Avalanche members that Barrett talks about in his resolution scene, Nelly, Al, Finn and someone else. But with what we've discussed before, it's just a theory, just some thoughts which might make sense. But here are two additional pieces of evidence that should probably elevate this theory to a near proof. And these are their badges. Well, let's start with the guy. It clearly says G.A. Army. 
A stands for avalanche, because it's red and stands out. Only makes sense. G, general, definitely not. Doesn't look like a general, doesn't really act like a general, and in general doesn't make sense, pun intended. So what else could it be? Grunt of avalanche army? Maybe. Or maybe ground avalanche army. So on the ground, the literal ground underneath Midgar and not those who are in charge of missions above the plate or even by chopper or helicopter as we've seen in chapter 17, which is why they're stationed here in sector 7, on the ground. This alone is nothing, not really any tangible piece of evidence. But what about her? It says A.S.O. Avalanche, SO, security officer, special operative. No, 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 no. Definitely not. Why? Because in the scene with Barrett, especially in Japanese, he says, translated, Nelly, who is in charge of handling materials, is often paired up with Jesse. Handling materials. And in the English version, he calls her the Quartermaster. And if you look it up, it says Quartermaster is also in charge of supplies, handling materials. So ASO most likely means Avalanche Supply Officer, which would fit perfectly to how Barrett describes her. And for a change, I personally didn't come up with this, but our dear scholar Rimavel did all the legwork on this. Thank you so much! And furthermore, a Quartermaster probably is also the group's leader, which then would also make her the one who kicked out Barrett and the others for being too extreme. Because my current theory is that there was just this one avalanche branch in Midgar, on the ground in Sector 7, with those four at least, and Barrett, Jesse, Biggs, Wedge and Tifa. But now they've been cast out, around a year ago, which now makes them the main branch. Because Barrett's cell is just a side branch of this area. Let me know what you think. And now come the enemies. Why do I show you the Kripshe here? If you look closely in the trailer, there's one that doesn't look like Kripshe at all. Here the double eyes, this really toothy maw, and the horns, which are not anything like those pincers or whatever you want to call it. And also has a different tail. It's longer, it's flatter, and doesn't have those spikes above. And is more purple than grey. And there's one recolor of the Kripshe in the original game, and this is the Edgehead, which incidentally is located in Wutai, or the Wutai area. Fits quite well, doesn't it? I'm a bit miffed that we don't get a better view on this one, this guy here. But yeah, alas. Just for reference, those are found in this little scene here, and you can even see that Kripshe are also around. It looks like there are three Kripshe, one here, one here, one here, and possibly the Edgehead or however you want to call him. And now, the Deep Ground Soldiers. And I really like this because I couldn't really see any difference. It's Everything is one for one, just a little more detail, like more dirt on the visor or the helmet. And they even kind of replicated the six-pack. Even though now it looks more like wrinkles in cloth, not actual six-pack. But the rest, one for one. Just perfect replica. Which is interesting because other enemies, especially security officers, formerly MPs, have been changed quite a lot. Still the same in general, but the details have been changed a lot. Those haven't, probably because they already had a quite high-resolution model. And it kind of fit the remake. The other ones were really plain, the normal Shinra infantrymen, so it makes sense. Now just some comparisons regarding Weiss. He's here on the throne. The throne looks a little bit different here, it's kind of larger in terms of Cerberus. But in general he looks pretty much the same. Even the knee protection and the way his muscles work and the head. The only real difference is that he now has a jacket on, which has been commented on by Nomura, that he wanted to add it to give him a better appearance. I don't remember the exact quote, but uh, just to improve the appearance for the fight here. And since he has something on his upper torso, he can also wear the gunblade katanas on his back instead of his lower back. So just higher up. 
which makes sense. And then last but not least, thanks to Shedamp on Twitter, we know that there's a little difference in the iris. Here this is there's a Cerberus, has, has this kind of weird diarrhea brown circle around the pupil. None in the VR version. The only sensible, actually two, there are two sensible explanations for that. One is it just didn't look good, they got rid of it, or it has lore implications because by this time Weiss has been taken over by Hojo, but this one's three years before, so Hojo hasn't taken over yet. This could be the difference. Maybe. Oh, and before I forget, there's also an interesting similarity between how she acts or her introduction in Dirt of Cerberus and here in the Integrate DLC. Let's have a look. My name is Yuffie, Materia Hunter and Elite Special Forces Operative for the new Wutai government. We'll prove to our common enemy that Wutai is not to be trifled with! Members of Avalanche, we got this! Well, I'm glad you asked. I am the champion of the Earth and the Sky. I am the conqueror of evil! The single white rose of Wutai! Yuffie Kisaragi! Feast your eyes on... <laughs> and that has been it for this pretty long, rough analysis of not even everything this trailer had to offer, but at least the visuals and the environments and the characters. There's more to come, deeper dive into the battle system and the boss especially, because this one's pretty interesting but also predictions about the story, which is also quite interesting. And I hope I will get those out also pretty soon because it's pretty much analyzed. I still have to work some details out. But other than that, it's also ready to record. And since it's a rough analysis, there's barely any editing needed. Still a little bit, maybe one or two days, but it should be good. There have also been some changes on the Patreon side. Our dear scholar Harkos has upgraded to the master level and the new scholar has joined. Welcome Chris as our latest Bugenhagen. Thank you guys so, so much for your support. It means a lot to me. If you like this kind of content, don't hesitate to give us a thumbs up and share this video around to spread the word. And subscribe and select all notifications to know immediately when the next video is available. In the meantime, follow us on Twitter for smaller analysis gems and join our Discord server for discussing all things Final Fantasy VII Remake Integrate with all our other eager scholars. Thank you all so much for sticking around to the end. Stay safe and take care. Bisuasath, signing off.